Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the AME Food Testing Show. Today's guest, Dr. Stephen Conrad. He became a member of the Resilience and Regulatory Effects Department at Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico in November 2012. Previously, he was a principal member of the technical staff in the Infrastructure Modeling and Analysis Department at Sandia National Laboratories, where he developed computer simulation tools to analyze the consequences of disruptive events on the nation's critical infrastructures. Steve was also at the National uh, Sandia NISAC Deputy for Analysis. Recently, Steve was the project lead to develop a risk assessment approach for protecting food supply chains against deliberate contaminations by a malevolent adversary. Steve has performed infrastructure independency assessments for California and an assessment of the effects of proposed security policies on operations in selected Pacific Northwest ports. He has developed a national scale model of interdependent agricultural commodities, beef, dairy, and corn, to examine the impacts for several major agricultural disruption scenarios. Steve has worked with Lucent Technologies to build detailed models of telecommunication system performance under various uh, operations and impacts for several major agricultural disruption scenarios. More recently, he's developed models of security dynamics related to the insider threat and has been involved in an ongoing collaboration with analysts at Aragon National Lab to develop a model for TSA related to improving their airport security checkpoint operations. In 2010, he completed work on a DARPA-funded project assessing the viability of refining jet fuel for bio-derived oil feedstocks. Steve has worked at Sandia for 22 years. Prior to joining the Infrastructure Protection Group in 2001, he worked at Sandia on various problems in the area of water resources, contaminant hydrology, problematic performance assessment for radioactive waste disposal, and systems analysis. He received his PhD from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. He has a Q-level clearance. Our topic today, stochastic mapping of food distribution networks to understand risks and tracing of contaminant pathways. I now introduce Dr. Conrad. Uh, to the AME Food Testing Show. Dr. Conrad? Hi, Andy. Happy to be here. Welcome to the show. Would you like to add anything to your illustrious introduction? I don't think so. Well, let's get on with it. What is the mission of the Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico? Okay, so Sandia's roots um, started with the uh, Manhattan Project. And um, after the war... um, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer established the Z Division at Sandia Base uh, near Albuquerque, um, and it, it was its purpose was to provide um, the engineering in support of the nuclear physics. So, Los Alamos National Lab was was doing the the nuclear physics. Sandia Labs was doing the engineering in in support of that. Um, so, s- since that time, um, it's grown into a multi-program, but mostly. Um, National Security Laboratory, and it's got about 11,000 um, folks working at Sandia. Um, of that, about half are um, in the the engineering and the R&D community. And um, let's see, probably about 1,500 of those are, are PhDs, and, and almost all of the rest have advanced degrees. Um, so Sandia is one of three nuclear weapons laboratories, um, along with Los Alamos and and Lawrence Livermore. Well, Dr. Conrad, that sounds like quite a brain trust. What is the National Infrastructure Simulation and Analysis Center? Okay. So um, it was established as as part of the the Patriot Act after after 9-11, and and, the purpose of, of, of this group, which is a, um, a, a joint project um, between uh, Sandia Labs and Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, it supports um, the Department of Homeland Security in um, doing analysis of, 
critical infrastructures, um, how they break, how they could be made more uh, resilient, resilient. Uh, what are the consequences um, when things break? And um, so we do um, modeling and analysis um, in support of the Department of Homeland Security, um, analyzing infrastructures, and we do it on a variety of of scales, so so we may look at um, um, things on a on a local scale, but oftentimes um, we look at these things in, as a at a systems level on a national scale, and we respond. Um, so, for instance, we can respond in literally um, hours to to immediate requests, and and some of our projects will last for multiple years. Um, an example of of the fast analyses that we do was so in, in support of of um, Hurricane Sandy, um, there were infrastructure questions about situational awareness of what infrastructures were up, what was the state of that. Um, for the infrastructure that was impaired, um, what would the consequences of that be in, in terms of uh, response and recovery um, to that weather event? So we've done lots of hurricanes, earthquakes, um, and we'll, we'll do um, scenarios that are that are opposed to us uh, by the Department of Homeland Security as well. So you receive a request to engage your computer technology and your brain power to help right. solve a problem. Awesome. Well, let's look at the subject for today. What is stochastic food mapping? Okay, so um, the idea of mapping of, of food distribution networks is if there's a contamination event, the faster that you can trace back to its source, identify that source, and then, um, and then start a recall, um, the faster that, the, that um, you interdict that, that process, um, the less people will be um, sickened from, from, from a food event. The problem is, is that in food systems, um, lots of, of parts of that network are, are not known, and they're not known for a number of reasons. Part of it is, is that the supplier-customer relationships and a lot of times are, are proprietary information. Um, other times, they are truly stochastic, which is, which is kind of a, a $2 word for, for meaning random. So. Sometimes I may buy oranges from you, Andy, and sometimes I might buy them from um, the fellow in the stall next to you, and it's whoever has the better price. So sometimes, so parts of these networks are are not known, and then part of them are um, changing on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. And what we're trying to do is not be impaired by that lack of perfect knowledge about the whole network, but to say, okay. So so since I don't know um, how how much how does that constrict me in my analysis, and I can still oftentimes um, do a fairly good an analysis even without perfect information, and so we're just using um, mathematics and probability theory to help us figure out you know what we know, what we don't know, and what things we're not sure of. You know, that's an excellent analysis for our food production, food quality, food safety, and food security managers that are worried about what happens to their product once it goes out to the market. The next question is, how are food distribution networks mapped in your simulation analysis center? Okay, so um, the data comes from a number of sources, um, from open source literature, um, sometimes it's from the news, so that um, we will see from, um, say, the CDC, they will have a report of an outbreak, and they will, and as part of that recall event, they will talk ab about who's supplying whom, and so we can use that as part of the, the, the mapping process. But mostly what we do is we talk to um, representatives in the supply chain, so people who work at wholesalers, distributors, um, the retailers, all the way through the supply chain, um, trying to, to um, ferret out this customer-supplier relationship and try to map those things 
beforehand. So when there's a contamination event and and um, public health officials are trying to track trace back the source of contamination, they're kind of behind an eight the eight ball because it's already happened and they're racing against the clock. And what we're trying to do is is map these things, these um, stochastic networks ahead of time so that so that uh, we have a head start on those kinds of things. Now, in our group, we're a uh, relatively small effort, so there are about a half a dozen analysts. And so what we're looking for is a way that we can take our approach and and have partners in in government and industry that might help us um, supply information about the network so that we can um, map those ahead of time. And, and there's value to the industry to do that because um, recalls tend to be um, fairly conservative and overly broad in the face of uncertainty. Um, but if these networks were mapped ahead, um, we could show proof positive for um, a lot of participants in the food distribution network that they are not um, actually part of that particular contamination event. So they would have um, kind of provable deniability and then may not be uh, sucked into a recall event. Very good. You recently conducted a study for your clients, which are apparently the government, right. on how we can understand the risks of contaminant pathways. Can you illuminate that for our audience? Um, so, and to give me a little bit more to, to, okay. to go on. So uh, how, do, how can we understand the risks of these contaminant pathways using your modeling? Oh, so what we're doing is, is, is we're, we're building these, these um, maps, and then um, what we'll do in a computer simulation is um, release a contaminant at a certain point in the in the distribution network, and then we'll watch where it goes. But the network isn't isn't static, and and what we'll do is we'll fold in the uncertainties that we have. So let's say that um, we have the, a 50/50 chance that that um, I'm the supplier to customer A versus customer B. In in one computer run, we'll we'll send my product to to customer A, and in the next computer run, I'll send it to customer B, and then we'll watch where it goes from there as well. And so at the end, when you aggregate all these different computer simulations together, then you can get a map of, of where contaminant definitely went, where it definitely didn't go, and the likelihood for all those kind of gray areas in between. Excellent. So with that information, government officials can map out the best areas to seek out the contaminated product and then not waste their time on areas that there's a probability it won't be. Is that correct? Absolutely. So um, public health officials have limited resources, and we want to help deploy them as effectively and as quickly as possible. So let me ask you this question. Can stochastic food mapping help with outbreak tracebacks using this modeling in defining the best places to search? Um, yes, we believe they can. So this is an ongoing area of research, and our, our initial um, research results are, are quite promising. Um, and and um, we're in... Um, in discussions with um, some public health officials, where they um, will give us some of their data so that we can we can we can look at the networks and and kind of pretend that we know nothing going in, and then see if we could have um, directed them to the source of contamination in less steps than it actually took them. Very good. What is the topology of food supply networks? How does that work? Okay, so um, uh, topology is is just the the configuration of the network itself. So there are nodes in, in our um, mapping. We have nodes and we have links. So 
So we have facilities, and then we have the customer supplier relationship, which are are, are the links between those. And um, when you when you map those things out to get all together, it's that picture of that whole network is is the topology. Um, sometimes um, you can see some interesting things when you look at, at the topology. Oftentimes in in food networks, we'll see what we call a bow tie topology, where many sources of of, of suppliers will come into a single, say, processing plant, and then from there it will be um, widely distributed um, to distributors and then ultimately to retailers. So it comes into a single point, and then it, and then it's distributed uh, widely from there. And it's at those points, those knots in the bow tie of that topology, that are sites that are especially um, ripe for um, for some malicious adversary to um, to contaminate food because the distribution um, is so wide from that point. You know, that's an, a very important point to raise with our audience because many of our audience managers are very familiar with food production, what it takes to get a product out. They're very familiar with the food quality issues, size, shape the quality issues of taste of a product. What a lot of our managers are somewhat unfamiliar with because it's new is food safety issues like uh, will the product get someone sick and food security which is the intentional contamination of a food product as an act of terrorism with your probability maps of the seed to consumer pathways would government officials be more empowered to respond to an outbreak event? Um, yes. So, in in two ways. One is is um, just having the expertise to know more about how the overall system is configured, which can then help you trace back and and trace forward uh, more quickly, and 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 the other way is 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 through um, use of these computer simulations, so that that we may be able to do that in in real time. Which which so there's the there's the 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 learning that you that you get from um, understanding more about the system, and then there's the the, the answers that you get from the computer simulations itself. So there are there are two ways in which they're helped. So what I'm hearing from you, Dr. Conrad, is the issue of a tactical response in the event of an act of terrorism, either intentionally or inadvertently contaminating food as it goes out to the distribution network. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and, and the difficulty thus far has been because these networks can't be mapped perfectly, it's it's almost like that we're lost. But if we can map them at least partially, then that can give us a, a good head start in, in um, figuring out how to trace back and trace forward more effectively. Very good. Would you like to define for our audience your findings on the best models to assist you in a robust food defense strategy? Because I noted in your paper you had a number of models and some of them look like more like spider webs of activity and oh. as you mentioned these bow tie, uh, bow tie type uh, distribution networks. Right. So um So one map is not necessarily better than another, but each you know each sector of of the food distribution system they they tend to look different from from one to the next so it's if you've done you know some sort of um, network uh, modeling of the beef network, it doesn't tell you very much about dairy and it, and it doesn't tell you very much about processed foods or fresh cut produce. And so um, we're learning um, as through this mapping exercise um, 
what each of these networks um, look like, and and then you know, so where are the the, the points of, of vulnerability located? Let me give you an example of the uh, an, the initial study that we did, which was on um, New Mexico alfalfa sprouts. So, um, and we chose that network because it's because um, the shelf life of sprouts is so short, about seven days, those networks tend to be local to regional as opposed to national. And so it made the network smaller and, and easier for us to map the first time out. Um, so in looking at that network, um, on one part of the network, you know, we saw a big jumble and a lot of uncertainty. And then in another part of the network, we saw um, a single supplier or a, a single seed grower um, supplying a single alfalfa sprout grower, which then supplied um, three different um, grocery um, chains. And that network was entirely disconnected from the, the rest of the network, that jumbled part of the network. And so that told us that if you saw contamination in any of those three grocery store chains, we knew exactly who the grower was and then who the, the seed supplier to that grower was. And the problem is solved very, very quickly. Now, if, it, if the contamination were seen in the other part of the network, um, we knew that, that those three grocery store chains and that, that sprout grower that supplied them, they couldn't have been the source of the contamination because there's no connection in this particular instance between those two parts of the network. And that's how we can make the, the, the problem um, smaller, easier, um, facilitate the, the trace back. And also, um, if there was a recall and you knew what that network looked like ahead of time, then you would know that you wouldn't need to recall the sprouts from, from those three grocery store chains. Very good. Does the public have access to your study? Well, um, it was um, published in an academic journal, and um, I've made a number of uh, presentations, and um, so I could uh, make that uh, paper available, and um, also I have a unlimited release uh, presentation about um, the work that we've done that uh, I'd be willing to send to whoever was interested. Great. I will post those links on Great. the Blog Talk Radio site so that others may look at those models. Are there any contributions that the, gener the general public can make, like food producers or others, to your database? Well, you know, we are looking um, for partners. Um, uh, people. Um, that are working in the food system that um, that um, have information that you know pieces of their network or are interested in um, in in working with us to to map that information so that uh, so that we can do trace back more quickly. Perfect. Is it in the beef, dairy, or fresh produce arenas? It's. Uh, in the fresh produce arena, but we're um, interested in um, developing um, our knowledge in all of those areas. And so um, any sector of the food network, um, we're interested in uh, talking with them and, and, and learning more about the how their network operates in specific. Very good, Dr. Conrad. I'd like to, at this time, allow you to summarize our conversation on your study uh, in, in a couple of words. Tell us what's the mission of the Sandia National Labs, uh, your particular department, your project of stochastic food mapping, and any other issues that you'd like to bring up that your paper discovered, and then conclude with a final closing statement. Okay. So, um so I work at uh, Sandia National Laboratories. Um, we're a national security laboratory. Um, so part of the national security mission is is, is keeping the food supply safe, um, 
As part of that, I work in, in a program called NESAC, the National Infrastructure Simulation and Analysis Center, which uh, looks at critical infrastructures, um, how they break, how they can be more resilient. Um, as part of that, I, I lead a small group that does uh, food defense, um, looking at uh, malicious attacks on the food system. Um, the work that we've done in stochastic uh, mapping of food uh, distribution networks can also be used in food safety. Um, those, those mapping techniques allow for the more rapid trace back of contamination events and um, more efficient recalls. And um, from knowledge of those networks, um, we can yes do that faster, but we can also um, avoid overly broad recalls based on the lack of knowledge. Very good. Would you like to summarize your conclusions of your study? Well, so this is again a relatively new piece of work. Um, so we're seeing um, interesting uh, results um, coming in uh, to begin with, but uh, what we're interested in is um, looking for um, industry and government partners um, who um, would like to help apply um, this modeling effort and so that uh, traceback can be uh, expedited. Very good, Dr. Conrad. I'd like to now allow you your finishing and closing remarks. I'm not sure that I have too much to add to all that, Andy. Well, I really appreciate your time you've given us. I personally consider the Sandia National Labs a national brain trust, and there have been many technologies which have been developed for the Department of Defense which have been enabled in the private sector but it just takes a long time to get out. And this technology is at its foundational stage. And eventually, we may have many such models that will help us to faster uh, recall products which are contaminating or sickening our population. So I'd like to thank you for your efforts. And also, thank you for your time today to chat okay. with us in our audience. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Great. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you.